this last round table is going to take a look at the health system. And the health system, as you know, is not just clinical medicine. It's public health, it's clinical facilities, it's laboratories, it's a whole series of things underpinned by sound policies. And so we have three excellent panel members, and I'd like if you'd come up, uh, Raman and, and Steve, if you'd come up. Um, Raman Askari, as we heard earlier, is a professor of, glo of global health and the director of human <clears throat> humanitarian health masters program here at the Millican. And John is an adjunct professor here at the Millican School of Public Health and is um, in addition at the University of Colorado. And Steve is um, the vice president at the Center for Strategic, I always have to CSIS, I know, Strategic and International Studies, the Global Health Group at, uh, at CSIS. So I, I will not go through their CVs, but I know you will see as they answer questions, the depth of their understanding and knowledge from their personal experiences. So what we're going to do is talk about how health systems adapt to the influx of immigrants and displaced persons while ensuring that the general population in that area is also served. And we've heard from Carl about many of the barriers to that, um, whether they're capacity or, or even discrimination against the uh, migrant populations. We've heard from Josette about how fragile these systems really are, especially at times of natural disaster or as in the case of Lebanon um, um, war. And we've heard from um, Kevin also about how we should really think about these issues because these are really personal issues for many people as well as issues in general for everyone. And you'll remember Kevin lost his um, goods at the airport or at the train station and felt incapacitated as we all do when we lose those things, including our essential drugs and medic medicines. And so I'm gonna turn to Raman and I'm gonna ask you to tell us your experiences in restoring to people their, the drugs that they need, maybe for non-communicable disease or whatever, and how health systems can adapt to do that from your experiences. Thank you. Uh, well, we haven't brought the models for providing health care to the different population, dispersed population. I, I want to start with uh, with stating that the, the models need to be, you know, adaptive and adjusted to the context because there are population differences. Now, if you have a displaced population coming, let's just say from Rohingya to Bangladesh or inside Sudan. They're going to be different from the population displaced in former Soviet states or Central America because they have different house literacy, they have different differences in background and the conditions. Let's just say in Rohingya, we faced you know the epidemics of uh, of diphtheria and measles because the low rate of vaccination and prior healthcare access. They may have a different expectation as well. And uh, let's just say in former Soviet states, you know, they're coming with the, you know, ex expectation of a tertiary healthcare, you know, rehabilitation and everything is provided and that's different from different population. And, and also devising a healthcare system for the different migrant groups depends on the status that they have during the acute phase or during the journey that they have or well, when they are you know, in a more uh, kind of a stable situation, although most of the time it's going to be protracted. And uh, these are all, you know, also going to be impacted by logistical, you know, barriers, uh, organizational barriers, you know, who are the actors who are available there in terms of both local and international. And security is going to be significant issues. Let's just say if you have this displaced population in um, more than part of Somalia or, or a different part of Somalia, then, you know, the security is going to dictate to you a different type of remote, perhaps, access for them or support for them. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can use a primary care system because the, the population is more adapted to that. And, and, and sometimes you just have to be completely uh, vertical program. And so I think you have to be opportunistic. So my experience has been in all of this context, and I think, um, uh, you know, I, I'm going to talk most of the elements of, uh, in terms of processes as, as opposed to like really a kind of like a, a, a one size fits all because it's not going to be the case. So the elements is uh, understanding the background of the population, understanding resources that the actors they have and resources are available at the local level 
and uh, and those resources uh, are not just like a physical kind of um, places that the healthcare is delivered, but also human resource, their background in terms of their skill sets that they have, um, as well as uh, requirement and regulations. So if you want to do, let's just say, task shifting, then you can't really task shift everything that you think they can do. You have to follow some kind of rules. And then, um, also, you have to think about that if you want to use, and you have to use local resources, and I think Carl was talking about the majority of dispersed population ended up, ended up being in the same country or adjacent country that they share a lot of social cultural background. And, and so, you know, if, it, it's, if you want to create a system to support them, you have to have that system available to the local population as well. It's good because, you know, there's more opportunity of, uh, let's just say, capacity building, inconsistency in approaches, but also I think you're more prone to use it. And uh, let me just give you an example. You know, I, I worked in, in a refugee camp in Sudan, and we started having a, a program for responding to victims of gender-based violence. So we, have, we had a rape clinic, let's just call it. And then we noticed that nobody is using it, and we had data that the rape is continued to be around and sexual violence is going to be around. And then we had to really go back and figure out, you know, what's the experience that they have. And then we started also having a program for, um, let's just say, family planning and people were not using. So this, this population comes from a background of being, um, you know, ethnically targeted. So for them, it was very important to actually have more kids and more children. And there was significant stigma, obviously, related to using the actual facility or clinic in, in terms of, you know, access to uh, post-exposure prophylaxis and all of those things. So so we really had to go to the back to the community, do a lot of um, qualitative work and understand what is it that they're going to actually uh, do and follow and what's the best approaches to do. Uh, so we had to adjust the program anyway. Um, another thing I think to consider in devising, uh, so this, this is the main point was that then we had a pop, local population host community and as well as the refugee community that had better access to care for the refugee population and that created also a tension between these two kind of groups. Um, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, yeah, I think that's good. What, what, what happens many times, I understand, is that the refugee health gets more money than the local. Are you able to divide that between the two and make it work for both? Or how do you deal with that, which causes the jealousies that you talked about? Right. I don't think we should do it. I don't think it's it's possible to do it. I mean, sometimes you have completely vertical program, and I have seen it in some, you know, uh, for some actors, because they have accountability, they have mandate, and you know everyone that they service it has to have a status. And then you know Rohingya population obviously is a great example of that. But uh, but the way I think the best way to approach it, at, at least in my experience, is that we always have in both sides of the conflict. By the way, not just the you know the displaced and host population, but for all the groups, the same access. And sometimes they are physically kind of separated because, you know, the refugees are in the camp, but the adjacent a bunch of villages. And then we set up also a clinics or mobile health center in those. And then we justify that because it's important to have that access because, you know, we talked about the acceptance and the governance and sense of community. We are all living together. Not an easy situation, clearly. <laughs> uh John, Raman mentioned something about measles vaccination and about vaccinations in general. Looking at the public health, not at the health facility, but at public health, what are some of the difficulties or the barriers in getting vaccinations, for example, to people who need them? Well, thanks for the question. I think the immediate thing that comes to mind, um, I would flip it to barriers to opportunities, one. and um, if you think about the response, I mean, it starts with policy and only in, the, I, I would imagine there are only a handful of countries globally that actually have a policy for vaccinating uh, people on the move, migrants and refugees. So that would be point number one. And that, that I think resonates because I had, I had the honor of serving on the uh, WHO SAGE working group to monitor the, uh, impact or the progress of the GVAP implementation the last decade. And I saw firsthand when you have 
uh, indicators that you're measuring that you will contribute to action. In this case, you would measure all countries that have a national policy to vaccinate these these communities. So that's the first thing. And we also, with it, following that data, would motivate other countries to do the same. The content of the policy, and you said measles. Well, measles um, of all the regions is the biggest um, killer. Donald Joe just came out with a report that, we, that I believe some 57 million deaths have been avoided by measles vaccination from the year 2000 to the year 2022. 57 million deaths. And in my opinion, I think it's arguably probably the greatest public health achievement in the history of humankind. I mean, what a program to save 57 million deaths. So it behooves us to continue vaccinating, particularly in high-risk groups that suffer from low coverage. You know, COVID is still with us. They disrupted, they put in old vaccination programs, so particularly in the most vulnerable. So there was an accumulation of susceptibles and the prediction of measles returning is happening now before us. And these communities that we're talking about today are going to suffer the most. So you put measles as the content of the policy, uh, and then there are other antigens, if you review the WHO recommendations and CDC guidelines, for example, I think that should be clear or, or it's easy to administer, but the answers would be just if they would test as tetanus, of course, hepatitis B, illness, influenza, the vaccine, and in the context of the local situation, policy should be flexible and adapt to the local context. It may be that you have a fever and cholera vaccination being very, very important within the context of that situation. So um, I would have, I could go through a, a list of other recommendations, but those would be the two I would focus on in the interest of time. Uh, thanks. So, so understanding the population and their risks is what's really yeah. important in the vaccinations. Thanks. Um, Steve, you're um, a great advocate for global health and your reports are spread throughout the world on your advocacy. Um, how do you advocate for displaced populations to be sure that they're, that they're prioritized in global health agendas and maybe in the US or, or elsewhere? Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to see Carl. Um, we, a few years ago, we put out a movie documentary called The New Barbarianism, which was pointing to a rising tide of armed attacks upon health sector and conflicted fragile settings you kindly hosted us. I think it was at the London School. Um, the, we're at a, we're, uh, to get to your question around advocating, you know, at the end of the Cold War, we had a, a surge of, of, uh, uh, of runaway conflicts and we had a surge of demand on the humanitarian side and the health side. And there was a lot of institutional innovation and a lot of learning that happened in that period. We're at another moment right now where we are uh, seeing the demand ex increasingly exceed capabilities. And you can, you can sort of unpack the different factors that have come into play to make this happen. You've got the chronic emergencies that haven't gone on. You've got massive new ones like Sudan. You've got the geopolitical wars in Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine, now Middle East, which are generating enormous demands, wars of attrition with no clear end in sight. You've got climate change creating new migration patterns that are not going to ease up uh, anytime soon. We're going to have a different demography to deal with looking ahead. Uh, and we've seen the, the budgetary and the, the debt issues within low and middle income countries, the debt overhang from COVID uh, resulting in sharp declines in health budgets. Uh, and you're seeing ODA uh, uh, in Europe getting diverted into into the emergency uh, uh, into the emergency uh, docket as well. So my first point is, if you're going to advocate, you need to paint the big picture. And the big picture is one that is historic transition moment, where the demand is exceeding uh, capabilities, a dramatic demographic shift happening, and it's going to get worse. There's no indicators 
that this is that the drivers are going to abet or ease off in this period. So um, that moment's here. I don't see very good evidence of a rethink coming forward. We just had the summit of the futures in New York. That didn't accomplish much that I could see in this regard. Uh, so we do have to ask the question, how do you get that conversation going? Uh, where Because it implies different institutional capabilities are going to be needed in this period in, in delivering humanitarian and health services into an increasing, increasingly difficult and expansive uh, set of demands. My second point is to, it would be helpful in advocating to remind people of things that have gone well in incredibly dire circumstances. The most impactful and dramatic, to my mind, re of recent vintage is the first round of the polio campaign in Gaza, which went pretty well against all odds and all predictions. And the second round is about to begin. And we need to sort of unpack how was it possible? Well, it had to do with playbooks. It had to do de determined institutions that had a habit of working in these environments. It had to do with high level political will that was brought to the table from all directions upon both the IDF and Hamas. And it, and, and, it, and it was a workforce that was there that could be trained, protected, and deployed effectively. I think you could go back to Ebola in the Kivus, Kivus in 2018-19 uh, and make a similar case that there was a lot of transferred learning from West Africa experience into the Kivus. It took two years to arrest the outbreak, but it was it was possible. You had workforce, you had playbooks, you had in courage and leadership. Tedros made, I think, 13 or 14 trips into the Eastern Kivus. Uh, and so those instances, painting the big picture of demand and the historic moment we're in, but also uh, un using stories, creating stories of success amidst unbelievable adversity is very important. Last thing I'd say is keep your eye on MPOX because uh, we, uh, you know, the it's in it's in uh, uh, like polio in Gaza. MPOX is in the perfect mixing bowl in uh, in uh, in in Eastern Congo. Uh, anyone uh, anyone younger than thirty six years of age has had no smallpox vaccination, has no no protection or immunity. The clade 1B is the Omicron moment. It's moved into faster, different transmission, much, much higher mortality. We have no idea what's going on, and, and it's not going to be e easily contained. And it's already. And so that also is, is going to dominate a lot of discussion around how did this happen and what can we possibly do? And it's going to return us back to these questions around vul highly vulnerable displaced populations, which in the case of the Kivu is what, it's 6 million IDPs that are densely populated. Goma's got 2 million people, Bukavu 1 million, uh, and, and the MPOX is embedded there. It's now endemic. So we never ha have had a, a virus of that, small of, that, of that type of the speed and transmission, heterosexual and in interfamilial household transmission. And that's going to, I think, uh, uh, fix our attention. So all of these things, I think, uh, make it possible to begin to focus policymakers' attention upon what this is, because it's a real. There's a real threat there, and and people are going to be puzzling. We're also entering a political transition here, a uh, very uncertain and unsettled one. But even with the craziness of our own political electoral cycle, this is a period we're in a a, a change. We're in, we're in a period where ideas, people are searching for ideas for the next four-year period. And so it's important to be putting these ideas forward now. But thank you. Thanks. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to run out of time, so we're not going to have time for much more. But, you know, earlier today, we heard both from uh, Bill and from J Josette the importance of community involvement and community involvement for sustainability of these activities in the long term. And I, I would just say that it's very easy for a political leader to say, we need a vaccine for MPOX, and they're pushing the vaccines out. What they need is good public health in the communities, whether it's a gay community, which was able to stop MPOX spread in their community, or whether it's a community of refugees or displaced persons. And so we can look at the top level and say, here's what you need. What they really need 
is an understanding in communities that they can stop this without a vaccine. Identify cases, contact trace, uh, isolate contacts, and find other cases. John, yeah, then we're going to end. Thank you for saying that. Uh, when you mentioned this, I had a deja vu moment of being a district medical officer in Malawi on the Zambian border. We got a lot of Zambians coming across the border for medications they did not have at that time. They you had to go to the hospital in Zambia. You had to bring tubing. But the point I want to make is that the system in Malawi and countries of West Africa had a district development committee. And that resonates with what Bill mentioned as a priority. The postmaster, the schoolmaster, the police chief, they all met and reviewed on health status. We at the hospital decided, let's go to the six poorest villages in our district and talk about VIP pit latrines. And we measured it and did, I think, some nice things. Well, when the district development committee heard about it, they wanted to know, why don't you come to my committee, my, my village, which, which that worked. That's a model that works. And I think reinforces what Bill had to say, that when you get that community engagement, you can really make a difference because it's coming from, from the community. Thanks. And that's a hard thing to advocate for. But, you know, the whole world is looking at a decolonization movement where things are moving from the center to the periphery and coming back up rather than coming out from this, the top. So I think we have to be listening very closely to what communities say and to the messages that we've heard today and, and try to move this ahead because we, the one thing we don't want is displaced and, and migrant populations not to have health care because that damages their community and it damages our communities as well. So, John, I'm going to turn it back to you, and thanks very much for having to the panel for having participated.